Amen. Well, let me invite you to turn in your copy of God's Word now uh, to the fer- very first chapter in the Bible, Genesis chapter 1. Genesis chapter 1, as we continue now our study of this book that we began just a couple of weeks ago. And uh, this morning, we're going to look at uh, all the days of creation. Uh, Next week, Lord willing, we'll look at uh, the creation of man in particular, but I want to tackle all of the six days of creation and then the seventh day of rest this morning. As always, you can find that on page one in your pew Bible. So let's give our attention now to God's Word. Let's begin at verse 1, but of course the sermon is going to be focused on verses 3 through chapter 2, verse 3 this morning. This is God's holy Word. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. And God said, let there be light, and there was light. God saw that the light was good, and he separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And there was evening, and there was morning the first day. God said, let there be an expanse between the waters to separate water from water. So God made the expanse and separated the water under the expanse from the water above it, and it was so. God called the expanse sky. There was evening, and there was morning the second day. And God said, let the water under the sky be gathered to one place and let dry ground appear. And it was so. God called the dry ground land and the gathered waters he called seas. And God saw that it was good. And God said, let the land produce vegetation, seed bearing plants and trees on the land that bear fruit with seed in it, according to the various kinds. And it was so. The land produced vegetation, plants bearing seed according to their kinds and trees bearing fruit with seed in it, according to their kinds, and God saw that it was good. And there was evening, and there was morning the third day. And God said, let there be lights in the expanse of the sky to separate the day from the night, and let them serve as signs to mark seasons and days and years, and let them be lights in the expanse of the sky to give light on the earth. And it was so. God made two great lights, the greater light to govern the day, and the lesser light to govern the night. He also made the stars. God set them in the expanse of the sky to give light on the earth, to govern the day and the night, and to separate light from darkness. And God saw that it was good. And there was evening, and there was morning the fourth day. And God said, let water teem with living creatures, and let birds fly above the earth across the expanse of the sky. So God created the great creatures of the sea and every living and moving thing with which the water teems according to their kinds, and every winged bird according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. God blessed them and said, Be fruitful and increase in number and fill the waters and the seas and let the birds increase on the earth. And there was evening and there was morning the fifth day. And God said, Let the land produce living creatures according to their kinds, livestock creatures that move along the ground and wild animals, each according to its kind. And it was so. God made the wild animals according to their kinds, the livestock according to their kinds, and all the creatures that move along the ground according to their kinds, and God saw that it was good. Then God said, let us make man in our image, in our likeness, and let them rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air and over the livestock and over all the earth and over all the creatures that move along the ground. So God created man in his own image, in the image of God he created him, male and female he created them. God blessed them and said to them, Be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air and over every living creature that moves on the ground. Then God said, I give you every seed-bearing plant on the face of the whole earth and every tree that has fruit with seed in it, they will be yours for food. And all the beasts of the earth and all the birds of the air and all the creatures that move on the ground, everything that has breath of life in it, I give every green plant for food. And it was so. God saw that he had made, all that he had made, and it was very good. And there was evening, and there was morning the sixth day. Thus the heavens and the earth were completed in all their vast array. By the seventh day, God had finished the work he had been doing. So on the seventh day, he rested from all his work. And God blessed the seventh day and made it holy. Because on it, he rested from all the work of creating that he had done. And there ends the reading of God's holy, inerrant, and inspired word. 
As always, let's pray now for the Holy Spirit to open up this text for our edification. Let's pray. Our God and our Heavenly Father, you who have created all things and you who have given life and you who sustain life this morning. Father, for all of us present here now, grant us new life. Father, bless us through the preaching of your word. Send your spirit that he would abide upon the hearts of the people present here. Father, that he would give new birth and regeneration to those who stand and need it. For those who, who need refreshment and encouragement, Father, we pray that your spirit now would show from your word and speak to them very personally. Father, you have ordained that through the preaching of your word, you would build your church. And so, Father, now, do that this morning among us. And we ask this in Christ's name alone. Amen. Well, one of the most rewarding things about being a builder in the five or so years that I spent building with my dad was the satisfaction of completing a project and driving away. And if it was a house, looking at it in the mirror, knowing that we had put parts of all of the house together. In fact, the most satisfying project, I think, and I think my dad would have agreed with me on this, was uh, many years ago, we actually built a spec house from ground up. Uh, we bought the plot, we drew up the plans with an architect, and we, we did all of the work pretty much ourselves, except for the foundation and a few other aspects. And so it was very exciting. With every stage, we were seeing slowly but surely the plans that we had drawn up come together. We had the ground poured, we framed it, we roofed it, we painted it, we trimmed it out, all of these things. And when we finally sold the house, and as we drove away, there was just satisfaction that we had done that and had completed it. Well, that's exactly what Genesis 1 is teaching you this morning about our God. That in the period of six days of creation, and then the seventh day resting, God, after he had completed it, just like a builder looks with satisfaction or, or whatever your calling is, and, and with satisfaction as a job well done, on the seventh day, God enjoyed his creation. And with all of the six days, like constructing a house, there are various elements of excitement as it builds and as the picture of God's creation comes to fullness. And by the sixth day, you realize what God had in mind on day one finally is completed. We see the glory, the majesty, the delight, the amazing power of our almighty God who creates through the period of those six days. And you see, as we saw last time, God is doing this to introduce himself to his people. Genesis 1, in, in, in many respects, is meant to teach God's people, this is who I am. And now as we look at the, the six days of creation and the seventh day of rest, God is showing you he's a God of design, he's a God of order, and he's a God who delights in his creation. And so we're going to look at that this morning as we see our pre-existent God fashion creation by speaking this is the theme I want to bring to you. We learn God's powerful word brings life and design to creation. A little bit similar to what we saw last time, but God's powerful word brings life and design to creation. Now, I wrestled with how to deal with this text. There are so many ways we can approach it. In fact, I was blown away at the commentaries I bought of how much is written on this chapter. Tons of pages, so I wrestled with how to deal with it. And in the end, I decided just to go verse by verse through it. Two points. First of all, our big point. Let's go through the days of creation. I just want to go through each day uh, and highlight the important aspects of it so that the, the Bible will speak for itself on what God says about it. And then the second point will be much briefer. Let's look at the design of creation. Secondly, we're going to make some points of application from that, but God's design in creation. So the days of creation and then the design of creation. So, the days of creation, and before we go to day one, I need to make a comment on the days. Uh, if you've done any research and any study at all on Genesis 1, you likely know there's been no end of controversy ever since the start of evolution on what these days mean. And so I spent some time this week, and the commentators are filled with uh, study on this, on what the days mean. The reason for the controversy it's not because the Bible opens itself to this, but because, if I can say it this way with all humility, because of a view of theistic evolution, people are trying to force that view onto the text that's, as I hope to show you, is not there. Uh, let me give you a couple of reasons. There are many more reasons why these days are normal 24-hour days, but let me give you just a couple that I think are the most important. First of all, the Hebrew here for day, the day Yom, we, it can refer to an undistinguished amount of time. 
But in the Bible, overwhelmingly, it refers to a normal 24-hour day. Uh, that's where the debate comes in. Many people point out the few times this word can be used for uh, a longer or indistinguished period of time. And yet, when you put it all together, overwhelmingly, it refers to a normal 24-hour day. Second reason is that whenever this word for day is used in connection with a listing or an ordering, it always refers to a normal day. I think that's one of the biggest arguments for it, that we have a listing here where God intends to show a normal week, and that is exactly how we are to understand it. Thirdly, and this is another big one, the Ten Commandments assume that the seventh day for the Sabbath is a normal day based off a seven-week period. God himself, with his own finger writing on the Ten Commandments, or writing the Ten Commandments, assumes and implies that this is seven 24-hour days in a week. Fourth reason, the phrase that's repeated, evening and morning, clearly allude to this, the author, uh, alludes to a normal day period. There's really no other way to understand uh, that phrase, evening and morning. And then practically, fifthly, the marking out of time for all history has been uh, seven-day periods. And the only explanation for that is that God has woven it in creation. But here's my point this morning. I think the only way to understand Genesis 1 is seven days, a normal week, and each day being 24 hours. Uh, there's no reason to take it any other way. And if I can put it this way, again, with all humility, there's no other way to honestly read the text. The only reason you would want to do this is to force your view of secular science on the text, and I would argue that science, rightly understood biblically, does not disprove this, but actually the Bible proves science. We don't need to concede that. So my point is simply this, these are seven 24-hour days for those reasons. Now, let's go through them then, and I'll move quickly, but let's go through each of the days. First day, notice with me verses three and five. And God said, let there be light, and there was light. God saw the light was good, and he separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And there was evening, and there was morning the first day. Uh, last time we looked at this, we ended with the creation being dark. It was formless and empty. And now on day one, God sets a boundary. He creates light. And now there's a, a divide. There is light, and there's darkness. Uh, very likely this is the light of his glory, but he, he created light particles. That light that, that now drives out the darkness, God creates light. And we know this is important because light is necessary for life. Life is necessary for living. Light is necessary for all of the things that we see all around us. And so God begins with light driving out darkness, and it makes a divide. God sets a boundary marker between light and darkness. Now, I mentioned this last time, but let me mention it again. We see here a picture that Christ will pick up. Remember the phrase that Jesus said about himself, that he is the light of the world. And almost certainly Jesus is referring to day one. And after the fall, darkness came through sin and rebellion. And Jesus comes now as the light of the world to drive out darkness. Beautiful picture here, because God in day one gifts light to creation. And now when Jesus comes, God gifts to us the light of the world. For the second time, when Christ comes... Through his sacrifice, he drives out darkness, just as we see on day one. Notice day two now. God separates the sky and the water, verse six. And God said, let there be an expanse between the waters to separate water from water. So God made the expanse and separated the water under the expanse from the water above it. And it was so. God called the expanse sky, and there was evening and there was morning the second day. Now, day two, again, notice there's a boundary marker set. God's in the business of separating things, and here he separates the sky, the, the atmosphere, from the water. Uh, there's much debate, there's much written, as I discovered this week, on that word expanse here, but I think simply, if you look at verse 20, what God is saying there is simply the sky. Uh, the atmosphere, that, that atmosphere that we know now keeps the oxygen in, that is what God created, the, the clouds that give rain. He separated the water of the atmosphere from the watery covered earth, and God created the divide. I want to make a point here that's going to come up in a couple of other verses, but it's significant that throughout the text, and in day two is the first time we see it, God names creation. Notice that he gives names uh, to the sky and the ocean. 
That's significant because in ancient days of the time of the Bible, if someone names someone, it shows that you are an authority over it. You are the sovereign one. And by God naming creation, God's telling Israel, listen, all of those false gods of people worshiping things of the sky and of the ocean, listen, those are false gods because I named them. I am the sovereign one. I fashioned all things, and I am the ruler over all creation. And we're going to see that a number of times throughout the text. Let's go on. Notice day three. Now God divides between land and ocean. Or verse nine, he says, And God said, Let the water under the sky be gathered to one place, and let dry ground appear, and it was so. God called the dry ground land, and the gathered water he call, waters he called seas. And God saw that it was good. Again, notice day three. What's God doing? He's separating. He's creating a boundary. Earth comes up out of the ocean, and now there's, there's the boundary of the ocean, and there's the boundary of the land. God has now created two, two environments, both of which he's going to fill with life, we're going to see in a moment, and God divides between them. Of course, as land-dwelling animals, as, uh, as humans, land is absolutely necessary. It's an environment necessary that God provides for us. Now look again on day three, God causes the ground to be fertile, verse 11, and God said, let the land produce vegetation, seed-bearing plants and trees on the land that bear fruit with seed in it according to their various kinds, and it was so. The land produced vegetation, plants bearing seed according to their kinds, and trees bearing fruit with seed in it according to their kinds, and God saw that it was good, and there was evening and there was morning the third day. On the third day, God only creates the land and the boundary, but now God causes the ground to be fertile, and it produces trees, it produces vegetables, it produces all the green plants that we see around us. And, and there's a description here, an illusion here, that, that God gives some of his power, as it were, to the ground, that the ground and plants now are going to be able to reproduce. And, and we are in the process right now of spring. Uh, you farmers are getting ready to put dead seeds into the ground, and when God provides rain and the warmth, we all know what's going to happen. Because on day three, God says that when a seed gives, uh, is put in the ground, the ground now will be fertile, if he blesses it, and there will be plants. God now produces all trees, all plants, all vegetation, and on the sixth day, he's going to turn around and gift it to all of his creatures uh, to provide food for them. So day three is ground and trees and plants and the reproduction of plants. Now, notice day four. There's a shift now. God now puts in what he did in day one through three, luminaries and light uh, on day four. Look at verse 14. And God said, let there be lights in the expanse of the sky to separate the day from the night and let them serve as signs to mark seasons, days, and years, and let them be lights in the expanse of the sky to give light on the earth. And it was so. God made two great lights, the greater light to govern the day, and the lesser light to govern the night. He also made the stars. On day four, in the expanse that God fashioned, he now creates the sun, he creates the moon, he creates the stars, all of the galaxies, all of the planets, all that we see on a dark, clear night that shines so brilliantly, all those stars light years away, on day four, God now fashions them into his creation. Now notice what God is doing here. He created light on day one, light particles, and now he gives to these luminaries, as it were, the power to reflect that light. We have the sun, the greater light to shine in the day, and at night we have the moon and the stars. God provides housing for the light that he created. And, and notice one other thing about this. God now gives us a means of measuring time. Last time we were in the text, we saw on verse one, God created time. And now on day four, with the planets, and the, uh, the moon rather, and the earth and the sun, he gives us a way to measure time. Think about that. As the earth spirals through the universe and as the moon spirals and circles around the earth, God has set it in such a designed way to tell us what season, what year it is, and all of these things. That is God's fashion. That is God's design. He has set all of these things by his sovereign will in the heavens. Now notice day five. He goes on. God now is going to fill the water and the sky with life. Verse 20. 
And God said, let the waters teem with living creatures and let birds fly above the earth across the expanse of the sky. So God created the great creatures of the sea and every living and moving thing which the water teems according to their kinds and every winged bird according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. Notice that day five reflects now day two when God separates the unit or the, the atmosphere from the water. God now turns the sky into the ocean and he fills them with life. Uh, to the sky, he gives birds. Just think about the vast variety of birds that we see. Big birds, small birds, co- colorful birds, uh, tons of species and varieties. God now creates those to fill his skies and to fly across them. And he does the same to the ocean. From the big giant whales to the tiny minnows and everything in between, God in a moment now fills the oceans, the seas, the waters with life. All of the sea creatures, big and small. Uh, One note here, notice the emphasis of the text on the giant sea creatures. This is intentional because in this day and age with the the giant whales and all of these unknown things, sailors were fearful and actually worshipped the gods of the ocean to protect them from such things. And Genesis 1 says, listen, those sea monsters, yeah, I made those. Yeah, I'm the one who put them in the water. That's our God. He is the sovereign one over all, big and small. Now, notice day six. Day six is the biggest of all the days. Notice now God fills the land with life. Verse 24. God said, let the land produce living creatures according to their kinds, livestock, creatures that move along the ground, and wild animals, each according to its kind. And it was so. God made the wild animals according to their kind, and the livestock according to their kind and all the creatures that move along the ground according to their kind, and God saw that it was good. And there it is. On day six, as God looked out on the land, the dry ground where there was trees and vegetation, God now speaks, and there they are, all of the animals, the, the bugs, the elephants, all of these things now crawling and walking across the solid ground. They roam the earth, And God takes delight in the beauty, the diversity, and the widespread uh, um, amount of animals that he has now fashioned. Now, since my kids love Answers in Genesis, and we recently bought a book on dinosaurs, I'd be remiss not to listen to what was said in there about dinosaurs. Uh, Day six is when dinosaurs were created. These are land animals. The Bible is abundantly clear. Dinosaurs did not come thousands or billions of years before. Day six, along with the elephants, the kangaroos, and your dog, there were dinosaurs because God created the land-dwelling animals. In other words, if I can already tip my hat at some of the application, there was no Jurassic period where billions of years changed where dinosaurs evolved into birds. God created dinosaurs with all the other land animals on day six. Six, And then in verse 26 and 28, we don't need to read that now. We'll deal with that next week. Notice that God creates the pinnacle of his creation, man and woman. We'll read that next week, Lord willing. Those people made in the image of God, they're created differently. God fashions them to be distinct because they will be rulers over his creation. And the last thing to note about day six is in verses 29 through 31. Again, we'll read that next week. God gives all the plants the trees and all the fruit to the animals. People ask, what did people and animals eat before the fall? The answer is right there. They ate the vegetables, ate the fruit. There is no sin yet. There is no death yet. There's no meat eating yet because God's creation is good. So here's the point. The six days of creation show a God of beauty, a God of design. And and I think here's the big point. Notice that God is a God who fashions an environment and then he suitably provides that environment with animals and life that perfectly are suited. Fish with gills in it so they can breathe the oxygen in the water where we cannot breathe. And then on the dry land, he gives humans with with the the type of toes that we have so we can walk on two feet and the four-legged animals of all different kinds. The point is this, God creates an environment and then he creates creatures suitable to that environment. And God is, as it were, flexing his muscles, saying, this is who I am. Israel, look at your God. I'm a God of beauty. I'm a God of power. I'm a God of great design. And from beginning to end, as the rest of the Bible teaches us, creation screams the glory of God. 
You know, I said it before, but let's say it again. As Christians, we should be the first people in science. Science is not contrary to the Bible, but the Bible proves science. Science is only possible because our God fashioned it with design. Have you ever thought of that? How is it that unbelieving scientists can run experiments and trust that they're going to come out according to the, the scientific method? The only answer is because our God has fashioned creation with design, with order. Our God has given us creation to have science, to study it to the glory of God and delight in his creation. Now, last thing about the days. We need to note here now the seventh day, the day of rest. Notice the day of rest that God fashions. Chapter 2, verse 1. Thus the heavens and the earth were completed in all their vast array. By the seventh day, God had finished the work that he had been doing. So on the seventh day, he rested from all his work. And God blessed the seventh day and made it holy, because on it he rested from all the work of creating that he had done. Now the emphasis here, especially in the Hebrew, but we get it from the English, is on the finality, the completion of what God had done. The emphasis on everything being finished, over with, and now we see that God rests. That word in the Hebrew for rest It's the word literally Shabbat. It's where we get the name Sabbath from. It means to rest. It means to cease. But I want to point something out. The commentators I read this week noted that it doesn't mean to just rest because you're tired. This is a special word. Shabbat means to rest, to enjoy. In other words, God didn't pause from his six days because he was wiping his sweat from his brow. Rather, this idea of resting is God pausing so that he can look out on creation and delight in it to see the chirping of the birds and to hear the chirping of the birds, to see the colors, to see the beauty. God spent with Adam and Eve on day seven a restful day just gazing upon upon his creation. Adam and Eve, they're walking in the garden with him, fellowshipping on Sabbath day was this huge day of delight where God is pointing out to Adam and Eve all that he had done for them and they enjoyed the day together. Now, there's much we can say about that. The rest of the Bible fleshes out that that is the point of our Sabbath day, that we cease, not because God wants to squelch our joy, but we cease to give us joy, that we'd spend a day out of seven enjoying fellowship with God. That's what the Sabbath is all about. And the book of Hebrews will make more on that. This is a picture of the good Sabbath where God is going to give us rest from our sin. Now, notice that God sets it apart. He makes it holy. It is one day in seven where God wants his people to join him in delight of his creation and delight in their relationship together. As I thought on this, I'm reminded of the Chronicles of Narnia. My boys love the Chronicles of Narnia, and one of our favorite books is The Magician's Nephew. If you've ever read that, it it accounts how Aslan creates Narnia. And it's this beautiful picture where C.S. Lewis shows Aslan singing and breathing creation into being. And then Lewis wisely and wonderfully points out Aslan laughing with his creation, enjoying his creation, walking with the animals and and delighting in them. That's exactly what Genesis 2 is all about. C.S. Lewis is getting that, this delight God has to walk among his creation, just as Aslan did in Chronicles of Narnia. Here's the point. God, in a period of seven days, accomplished his creation. And what you can write above your Bible, if you take notes, God is good. That's what Genesis 1 wants to show you. God is good. He has fashioned all things and he has given all things. There is no God like him. There's no other God and there's certainly no God like him. He is a good God. Now, more briefly, and I promise I will move quickly on this one. Secondly now, note the design of creation. And this point is necessary because if you caught the repetition throughout the text, God goes out of his way to tell you that this is a designed good creation. So first of all, the design, we see it in the constant refrain that God himself declares all creation good. When every day as it ends, God looks out on what he had done and he declares, God declares, this is good, this is wonderful, this is fitting. God declares over his own work the pronouncement that it is good. Now, I highlight that for a couple of reasons, but one, God cannot declare sin, corruption, good. When God, through the period of six days, declares things good, it's because they are good. There is no evil. Now, the reason I highlight that is because, again, in a Darwinian evolutionary, even a theistic evolutionary view, it requires millions of years of death and disease for evolution to take place. 
It requires, especially in the theistic evolution, every day animals dying, disease, change happening in order for the millions of years to produce. I would submit to you that is not viable according to Genesis 1. God cannot look on death and disease and destruction of his creation and say this is good. Once again, we see from Genesis 1, everything prior to the fall, God himself declare is good. The other thing that's important about God declaring things good is it teaches us that God wants us to enjoy creation. Think about that. Have you ever wondered why food tastes so good? Have you ever wondered why there's something in your soul that delights in a sunrise or a sunset? Here's the answer. God created uh, all things to give you that. God fashioned all creation with goodness in it so that as he put Adam and Eve in the garden, we would delight in the fruit, we would delight in creation. That is what it is to glorify God. God is good and he himself declares it good. And of course, when we see the fall, God will curse all creation so that it is still filled with goodness, but broken. Second aspect of design here, notice the design of life, that it reproduces according to its own kind. Again, we don't have time to reread it, but in verses 11 through 13, repeated over and over to the point where you wonder why they're repeating it, we're told that the, the plants, the trees, they reproduce seed according to their kind. Then in 22 through 25, you have the sea creatures and the land-dwelling animals. And over and over and over to the point where you're wondering why they're repeating it so much, God says they reproduce and they grow according to their kind. Again, God is highlighting his design. God is highlighting that he's woven through the fabric of all creation, design that reproduces according to its own. Therefore, when you have a dog who's pregnant, you're not surprised when it produces puppies because dogs do not produce cats. Why? Because they only reproduce according to their kind. Trees don't suddenly start growing carrots. Why? Because God created everything good with a design of reproducing according to its own kind kind. Now, I highlight that because, once again, this completely contradicts the Darwinian view of evolution. For Darwinian evolution to be true, species must evolve into other species. Animals must change from one kind into another. This is what scientists call macroevolution, and I would submit to you from Genesis 1, it is not true. Uh, The teaching today is, as we saw from Answers in Genesis, people are now promoting this idea that dinosaurs evolved into birds. Genesis 1 will not allow that. Dinosaurs do not change into birds. Now, I will say this, there is something called microevolution. That is, there is change in variance within species. The classic example, of course, is Darwin uh, examining the, the birds on the island and the ones with the bigger beaks because the smaller beaks died because of the food. The Bible absolutely acknowledges that. Because of environment, animals can have, have differences. There's ven- many types of dogs There's only one species of dogs, but again, the Bible makes very clear, God is a God of design. There's no accident, there's no change, God has created with that in it. So here's my point. When we talk about the design of creation, it teaches us that God is good and nothing happens by accident. He is the sovereign one, he gives names, he sets boundaries on it, and he is the only God that can do this. Now, real quickly in conclusion then, Know with me two brief things that this should teach you now as believers. As we come to study creation, the first thing we need to understand this morning is it teaches us by the goodness of creation the badness of fallen mankind. Did it not stand out to you that after every day God says things are good? And then when we look around, whether you watch the news or whether you just experience life, we cannot pronounce the same goodness any longer. Just in this last week, there are battles waging war. Nations are lobbying missiles at one another. Men and women are evil. Just think about human history. Men and women have done atrocities to one another by murdering one another. There have been horrible things that have happened. The goodness of creation is no longer there because of our sin. There is sin. There is disease. There is death. We weep over loved ones. And so there's this contrast between the goodness of creation that creates a longing because that goodness is not there anymore, and that's the point. Genesis 1 is meant to teach you that because of the fall, because of our sin, Adam and Eve's sin, we have tarnished the goodness of God's creation. That when Adam and Eve rebelled, we brought rebellion against our good God. We spit in his face. And every time you and I sin, we spit as it were in the face of our creator and said, we want nothing of you. We want to make our own name here. 
We don't want to serve you. We want to be gods of creation. And you see, that is what the consequences of sin are. If I can just put it this way, as we saw from the sixth commandment, just by the very nature that we are selfish, that proves that things are not good. Isn't that not the most humbling thing? And you see, that is the point this morning. Genesis 1 is teaching us that you and I need to be recreated. We need to be born again. We, had to ha- we need to have our natures changed. This is what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, he, or 1 Corinthians 5, rather. He says, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away and the new has come. Did you hear that? That is what Christ has come to do. He has come to die on the cross to recreate what was broken. His death was to come so that he could cause his people to be born again. Christian, that's the glory of the gospel. That if you've been born again this morning by the Spirit's power giving you a new heart, the reality is the Bible declares you are a new creature. That God has refashioned you once again. That you can see there's a glint of goodness yet. And when Christ comes back in the new heavens and the new earth, then once again we will declare with God for all eternity, this is very good. And you see, only through the death of Christ is that possible. Only through the sacrifice of His Son. So that is the wonder of the gospel. Let me ask you, are you a new creation this morning? Are you born again? Do you know this Savior by faith alone? Secondly, it also teaches us the goodness of God in the Lord's Supper. We notice that throughout the text, God provides. He gives food. He gives life. All of these things, He provides for His people. And that's exactly what the Lord's Supper is all about. As we come to this table in a moment, we're going to see the breaking of bread that is meant to signify nourishing our body, the the drinking of wine, which is meant to gladden the heart of man and to strengthen us. And God is testifying in this. I'm a good God. I have given you once again what you need. I've given you my son to give you new life. And I'm promising you in this meal, I will give you a new creation in the new heavens and new earth. Trust in me. Look to me. I am a good God. And if I can put it this way, this meal is meant to scream from the rooftop, God loves you as his children. And even as he saw his creation maligned by our sin, this is promising us that he is going to recreate all things for our good and his glory. Our God is a good God. Amen. Let's pray. Our good God and our Heavenly Father this morning, we thank you for what your word says about your creation. Father, humble us that as we think on what we have done through our sin and rebellion, Father, we thank you for Christ who has come to recreate us. Father, we pray, send your spirit now to convert the lost, to encourage your people that we would walk faithfully with you through this life until Christ returns. And Father, we ask this in Christ's name alone. Amen. Well, let us uh, respond together in song by turning to 251. 251, let's rise and sing together all things bright and beautiful.